Hello and a warm welcome to everyone joining us for Building the Fugitive Academy, Communication, Media, Culture, and Rhetoric Scholars on the Work of Transformation. I'm Anjali Botts. I am Associate Professor of Communication and African and African Diaspora Studies at Boston College. I'm also Associate Professor of Law by courtesy at Boston College Law School. I'm going to kick us off by thanking our sponsors and telling you a little bit about this event. I'm then going to pass the microphone to my co-organizers, Sarah Jackson, AJ Christian, Joe Shu, Anna McSaha, and Robert Mejia, who are going to tell you a little bit about their visions for the conference, as well as some of the sessions that we'll be hosting. This event was made possible by a long list of enthusiastic sponsors. I want to start by thanking the Institute for Liberal Arts at Boston College for their generous support. My appreciation to Shaylanda Barton, Gary Pandey, Stephanie Crisoli, and Julia Barrett. We absolutely could not have done this without you. Thank you to my intern for the semester, Kelly Michaela, the Communication Department, and the African and African Diaspora Studies Program. Next, I want to extend our gratitude to our co-sponsors, the National Communication Association, the University of Texas, Austin, Northwestern University, Media, Communications, and Cultural Studies at Goldsmiths University of London, the European Journal of Cultural Studies, the Annenberg School at the University of Pennsylvania, North Dakota State University, the Conference on College Composition and Communication, the International Communication Association, and last but certainly not least, the Rhetoric Society of America. Finally, I want to express my appreciation to my co-organizers who have brought wonderful energy and ideas to the table. This has been a difficult year for everyone, and I think I speak for all of us when I say that we're excited to share what we've been working on with you. We hope that these sessions can bring a little bit of relief and perhaps even joy. Now I want to turn to a passage from a recent New Yorker interview with Fred Moten. In 2013, Moten published The Undercommons, a slender collection of essays co-written with his former classmate and fellow theorist, Stefano Harney. For a book of theory, it has been widely read, perhaps because of its unapologetic antagonism. The Undercommons lays out a radical critique of the present. Hope, they write, has been deployed against us in ever more perverted and reduced forms by the Clinton-Obama axis for much of the last 20 years. One essay considers our lives as a flawed system of credit and debit. Another explores a kind of technocratic coercion that Moton and Harney simply call policy. The Undercommons has become well known, especially for its criticism of academia. It cannot be denied that the university is a place of refuge. It cannot be accepted that the university is a place of enlightenment, Moten and Harney write. They lament the focus on grading and other deadening forms of regulation, asking in effect, why is it so hard to have new discussions in a place that is ostensibly designed to foster them? Fugitivity is, in this way, a survival technique that works on and against the university. It is a practice that allows us to connect in fraught academic spaces. As the daughter of Indian immigrants and a person with chronic illness who is deeply invested in social justice, the idea of fugitivity resonates with me. This event is intended to provide a space for thinking about fugitivity and for imagining liberatory worlds that refuse the violence imposed on those who are different on a daily basis. We are interested too in the keyword of transformation in the vein of writers like Adrian Marie Brown, who stress the need to move away from carcerality and punitive forms of relationality. As the authors of Joyful Militancy might say, we are aiming for a shift from the rigid to the emergence, a space of radical openness and possibility. This conference originated with my desire to learn more about the histories, skills, strategies, and communities in which I found myself investing at work. 
Given the turn to social justice issues across professional organizations and disciplinary journals, I thought it important to understand that which came before and that which was occurring in parallel. I wondered if those in adjacent fields were involved in the same transformative labor. At a personal level, that's what this was about for me, thinking about how we can build connections around liberation in our fields and beyond. What we've come up with is an event that I believe emphasizes history, theory, method, and skill building in the work of transformation. We'll be hosting seven seminars in a traditional panel format and seven workshops in a how-to format today through May 7th. We welcome you to as few or as many of those sessions as you would like. I'm feeling quite humbled by the incredible group of speakers that are joining us. They're truly a formidable set of individuals. I encourage you to read about the event on our website. There we have information about individual sessions, our goals for the conference, and our recording policies. Our hope is to cultivate a safe enough space that centers structurally marginalized groups. We hope that you'll be able to use this event to explore new ideas, to ask questions, and to build community. Even though we don't have the ability to connect in person, we've set up a Discord channel for use during the entirety of the conference. I'm gonna stop there. Let me say welcome again. Thank you so much for joining us. I hope that we will have a set of fruitful conversations in the next weeks and months. With that, I'm gonna pass to my co-organizer, Sarah Jackson. Thanks to Anjali and everyone for tuning in. I'm Sarah Jackson. I'm an associate professor at the Annenberg School for Communication at the University of Pennsylvania and the co-director of the Media Inequality and Change Center, which is a joint project between ASC and Rutgers University. I'm also a first-generation college student from a low-income background, a Black woman, an auntie, a partner, a caretaker, and a human deeply committed to justice. Working to affirm these identities and values in academia is central to what brought me to this group, to planning this conference, and to my scholarship in general. I, for one, feel deep ambivalence as to if fugitivity can exist in any productive approximation in the current academy without being appropriated and commodified. I'm thinking specifically of things like the way that the labor of fugitive academics like us is spread across the landing pages of university websites, even as our activism and community engagement is valued less than this labor, and the forms of social and cultural capital that hierarchical institutions like universities gain uh, from our labor, even as they're designed to exclude us. So I'm really interested in imagining wholly new relationships and in institutions. Um, what might it look like to center the values of fugitivity and can we in fact even do that in our fields and our institutions. When we first began to plan this conference, the pandemic was not yet upon us and we hoped that part of our work here would be bringing people together to build relationships and space um, that would be full of fruitful opportunities for asking these kinds of questions. But the cruelty of the virtual pivot changed our plans and of course we innovated because that's what those of us at the margins are experts at doing, uh, making lemonade from lemons, so to speak. And so here we are um, with a very different kind of conference than we had initially anticipated. But I am excited about the new format, which includes both seminars and workshops and synchronous and asynchronous events in the hope that there is something for everyone. For example, I'll be moderating a live seminar on ethical and effective public scholarship with old friends and new that will locate our scholarship in community and communities and think about what kinds of mutually beneficial and justice-centered collaborations look like with communities. This will be followed by a recorded workshop organized by AJ and featuring more great folks that will provide tools and activities for engaging in public scholarship. 
So this is just one example of the topics we'll be tackling, or I guess rather embracing over the next few weeks. I feel deep appreciation um, to my fellow organizers who have just been wonderful in this process and to everyone who is joining us um, and really committed to the hard work of transforming the academy. While I'm sure we haven't done it perfectly here, my hope is that our work together over these weeks can be part of larger generative actions that go beyond the critique, the complaining, the talk the disma uh, of dismantling and decolonizing and actually begin to build up new ways of doing things that can, can really create a uh, lasting change. So one of the things I hope we build is a greater sense of beloved community and the relationships needed to create something new along with thinking through some of the ideas, theory, and practical application of the topics that we're tackling. So again, with that, thank you for joining us, and I'll go ahead and pass it on to AJ. My name is Marjan Christian, or AJ Christian. I'm an Associate Professor of Communication Studies at Northwestern University, and following Sarah's nice nod to intersectionality, I'm also a Black, queer, son of Caribbean immigrants from the New York City area, and a community-based researcher working in solidarity with Black, Brown, women, queer, trans, and non-binary people to transform entertainment. I signed on to help organize this conference, and I'm so honored to do so because I believe we need to do scholarship differently and transform research and te teaching as critical tools to build a better world. I joined to support a vision of academia where scholars share and build knowledge with people outside our walls who historically are not considered intellectuals, but who actually create knowledge and innovate all the time, both formally and informally. The challenge is we are caught in these systems, routines, and norms that were developed generations ago when academia was not representative of our world in its intersectionality. These systems determine our livelihood, disincentivizing us from challenging them and making challenging them quite difficult. We have to do, but we have to, and we have to do it across a number of realms, both in terms of publishing and the ways in which we define rigor, which I'll be moderating a seminar on and a workshop, in the ways that we teach, in the ways that service is defined by us and by the institution, and even in our methods for research. And I'm very excited to be moderating a public scholarship workshop on that topic. On this question of fugitivity, for me, Moton's concepts um, orient us to the ways in which we must practice a different way of doing scholarship in defiance of, and therefore perhaps out of view of, the powerful systems in which we find ourselves. Solidarity is, for me, the framework we need to do this. It is my hope that this symposium is the beginning of developing a shared language and shared practices so that we can fugit fugitively transform communication, media, and cultural studies into justice-oriented fields. And with that, I will pass it on to who's next, who I believe is Joe. Thanks, AJ. So I'm Joe Shu. My pronouns are they and them. I'm an assistant professor of rhetoric and writing at the University of Texas at Austin, where I am also core faculty in Asian American studies and affiliated with the LGBTQ studies program. I am trans non-binary. I'm queer, disabled, and neurodivergent. I am the child of Taiwanese immigrants. My experiences are very much conditioned by the intersections of all of those things. And I'm committed to creating vocabularies that can better explore the interrelations of race, gender, sexuality, and disability, and to creating spaces where people can bring their whole selves and feel welcomed for it. So I'm, I'm really grateful to my co-collaborators for this opportunity to explore coalition and world building in and beyond academic spaces. I joined this undertaking because, to borrow from the language of the undercommons, I've spent all of my time in this profession trying to figure out how to be in the university without being of the university. And, and I'm still working on that. For me to do this work, to have this job, to take my paycheck from the university, transformation does not seem like a question so much as an imperative. It is the only way to survive a structure built by white supremacy, heteropatriarchy, and ableism, at least for those of us for whom these institutions were never built. So I also see transformation as a responsibility. For as much as I know about the violence of academic institutions, for as much as I still experience, is, I experience these spaces as ones of harm, they've also been sites of refuge for me. What do I do with my educational privilege and the opportunities it has afforded me? 
I hope that I can help expand or rather explode the forms of knowledge and knowledge making that shape contemporary politics and culture, that shape conditions of vulnerability and privilege. For those who have survived these institutions before me, who made space for me, I want to do my utmost toward a collaborative vision of a transformative academy and, and one that is accountable to the communities around and affected by it. And that takes responsibility for the damage it has inflicted. This work is inevitably coalitional. We're not gonna go it alone. And the work of coalition is continually imperfect. It is something we must practice and unlearn and relearn as we go. I hope that our series of events, our conversations engage us all in that practice. So to add one additional term that informs my engagement with fugitivity, that term is care. I'm thinking of trans care as characterized by Hill Malatino and Crip Solidarity named by Mia Mingus, care as hard work, care as meaningful labor. What does the academy look like if we begin with the people we want it to include? What do we create in the vacuum left by economies of abandonment? How do we build it in a way that refuses to leave anyone behind? I'm interested in those questions, and, and that's one of the reasons I'm looking forward to moderating session two, Thriving Against Whiteness, care as active practice, as a mode of accountability, as a means of demanding more of ourselves and of our institutions. To me, all of that seems integral to how scholars of color foster the conditions for one another's survival. Um, like Anjali, I'm, I'm really blown away by the scholars who've committed to having these conversations with us, and I cannot wait to get started. And with that, I'll pass it on to Anamik. Thank you, Joe. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Onamik Saha. I'm a senior lecturer at Goldsmiths, um, University of London. I'm also the co convener of the Masters in Race, Media and Social Justice, which I helped create three, four years ago. Um, I'm also a brown cis man who was born in London to Bangladeshi immigrants. You can guess by my accent, born and bred in London. Um, and I'm one of the, I think I'm the only person in this uh, organising committee who's not based in the US. And I'm particularly excited to explore the parallels that happen between the UK and US in relation to the issues that we've just described. And I just want to say it's been an absolute honour working with all of these um, people on our committee. Honestly, it's been the most fun. It's been something I've actually looked forward to, even though it's been at, often been at the end of a work hard working day because of time zones. That's when we'd meet. Um, so I just want to basically talk about my own my own kind of particular angle on the topics at hand. Basically, my own work explores the politics of diversity as they play out in media industries, um, particularly in relation. I guess my hook is the commodification of racial identities in particular. And in that research, I argue that. I find rather that diversity serves an ideological function. It's seen as an addition rather than a transformation. That is a simple case of inserting kind of minoritized bodies into these institutions, the right amount, you know, not too many, the right amount of minorities bodies, minoritized bodies into these institutions. It's a way of me, diversity is a way of meeting, of appearing to meet the demands of minoritized people while keeping hierarchies in place. And, you know, quite frankly, diversity sits a little bit too comfortably within the language of neoliberalism and the marketization of academia more generally. So as much as I've made those points, you know, those arguments have come from my research on media industry specifically, we find exactly the same dynamics in academia. Um, in which case, the question that I'm really drawn to is how can minoritized people who often get tasked with the labor around equality, diversity initiatives, whatever your own department calls them, um, you know, the fact that we're tasked with those that labour, which is a part of the problem in itself, you know, how can we do that work in a way that resists, transforms, you know, do, how can we negotiate diversity as racial governance within academia, essentially? So for that reason, I jumped at the chance to moderate session four, the labour of inclusion, diversity, access and, and equity. And while, as I've said, it's often the case that it's minoritised colleagues who, are, you know, are later given this labour, to do. Many of us also feel an ethical, moral, political urge to do this work too. And that's a, you know, a kind of contradiction that we all have to, we all have to face. In which case, how can we enact change under the discourse of diversity that our institutions actually invest a lot into? How can we resist our commodification under the discourse of diversity, which, you know, which effectively gives reputational and brand value to our institutions? How can we manage day-to-day -day dynamics, but in a way that does not lead to the mere 
reproduction of those same structures that oppress us. So those are the kind of issues that I'm particularly interested in engaging with and that we will explore in these two sessions. I'm particularly excited, what excited me the most about this, um, this conference is the workshop format as well. So we will have these panels where we'll get some of the brightest, brilliantest, sharpest thinkers. I use the word brilliantist. I'm not sure if that is a word. I'm clearly not one of those sharp thinkers, but nonetheless, so <laughs> an incredibly like stellar group of people to talk about these issues and to educate us and who can enlighten us and, but also who will be welcome, open to our contributions as well. But I'm also really excited by the workshop format where we will try and create practical outcomes that we can all go away with and take back to our own departments. You know, one of the things that I've really realized about the pandemic is how much I've missed these conferences and getting together with people such as the people on this committee, um, and which are such an important resource and, and, you know, kind of such an important source of sustenance, which I need when I go back to my institution and to, you know, empower me to do the work that I do. And I hope that you feel, I hope this conference does that for you. So thank you very much. I'm going to hand over now um, to Robert. All right. Thank you so much for uh, the um, opportunity to be a part of this particular virtual conference. I want to thank my colleagues uh, who have already spoken before me. It's been an inspiration. I've learned a lot from this process. Um, my name is Robert Mejia. I'm an associate professor with the Department of Communication at North Dakota State University. My area operates in media and cultural studies. I want to speak a bit about why I'm interested in this particular conference and why I jumped at the opportunity to be a part of the co-organizers is that for me, um, my experience as a multiracial first generation college student, second generation Latino, is that um, survival is not a metaphor for me. Survival is something that's lived, it's an everyday practice, it is something that pervades all aspects of our existence, and in academia it's all too easy um, and it happens all too often for people to treat our experiences as if they're interesting topics as opposed to necessities, things that we do to live not just for ourselves within academia, but for those of us who are outside of academia. And so for instance, when I speak of survival, I speak of it in terms of my experiences on food stamps, secondhand clothing, layaway, um, also the anxieties about immigration in terms of how that affects my family members, how that affects me. Um, I also think about fugitivity, again, not as an interesting concept to think through, but how fugitivity is a part of what it means to exist as a person of color in society. I think of it as what it means to exist as a working class individual, um, as a child going to the grocery store and having to buy groceries separate from my mother so we could take advantage of discounts that had limits on the amount of items that you can purchase. Um, those instances and in everyday practices of fugitivity, which are what it basically means to survive in society. I, I also want to think about this concept in relationship to our session themes, particularly the session themes that I'll be uh, moderating, which is that so often um, it's easy to think about fugitivity as something that is done to give somebody uh, an unearned advantage or something that is an illegitimate practice, when what we really should be thinking of is how are um, these earned advantages structured or embedded in society so that way dominant practices are also a form of fugitivity, a form of criminality. It's just that they are legitimate. They are given these privileges. And so what I mean by this, speaking you know, session three, which I'll be moderating, uh, radicalized power, patronage, and mentorship, is how is power, patronage, and men mentorship structured in a certain way to benefit certain students, certain faculty, certain people in society, so that way when they go about their everyday practices, it's seen as normative, it's seen as natural, it's seen as just a part of their uh, um, natural merit. Whereas when other people seek out opportunities, it's seen as illegitimate, it's seen as something that defies the system. And so the reason why I'm elaborating on this point is that for me, it's important to understand that when we engage in fugitive practices, as others on this, uh, um, this particular session have discussed, is that we're really seeking out ways to transform the system so that way we can survive, transform the system so that we're recognized and seen, and to recognize that the system is often designed against us. And I'm not speaking of the system in this abstract uh, uh, conspiratorial sense, but more of this very embedded material sense of um, 
how our everyday practices are structured in terms of what teachers do in terms of when they recognize a good student, a deserving student, how some faculty are rewarded for um, the specific practices they might engage in, and how other pra uh, faculty are actually um, treated worse for uh, engaging with the community practices. And I'm thinking, for instance, of what Kimberly Moffitt has discussed in terms of how service is evaluated differently, depending on if you're a faculty of color engaging in community service with your area, as opposed to a faculty member who's engaging with service on the campus and serving a predominantly white uh, middle upper class community. The other comment that I quickly want to take is that uh, or make is in relationship to session seven, which is advocating for faculty, staff, and student survival, is to get back to that uh, point I'm consistently making that survival is not a metaphor, is that our survival doesn't begin nor end at the academy. That when we're speaking of survival, what we're really talking about is how the things that happen outside the academy, within, across the academy, affect all of our experiences. For instance, I can recall as a graduate student, we like to make these, or people like to make these comments about starving students and joke and laugh. And I'm always like, well, you have access to loans. You have access to deferred loans. Um, you have access to stipends. And I don't mean to minimize these experiences, but I want to put them within the context of what it means to be a working class uh, student of color who's thinking about how their stipend isn't just going to pay for their rent, but how it's also going to pay for their father's car payment or mother's car payment or sister's food or whatever it might be that um, is a part of our experience is that these things are connected and linked together. So the main thing that I'm interested in is that, again, survival is not a metaphor. To close, to, to conclude, um, I do want to, again, thank you for your time. Thank you for listening to us. We're all incredibly excited to be a part of this conference, as has already been mentioned. They're an incredible group of speakers, um, many of whom I can't wait to see myself, uh, many of them who I can't wait to, to meet. So our registration is live. You can find more about this conference through Boston College's the Institute for Liberal Arts website. You would go to the Boston uh, College's Institute for Liberal Arts, click on events, then underneath events, you can click on the event details for building the Fugitive Academy. Our first session on histories of disciplinary resistance featuring Gollum Kiyobani, Isabel Molina Guzman, Catherine Knight Steele, and Kurt Wilson will be held on March 12th from 1.30 to 3.30 p.m. Eastern Time. It will be followed by a workshop featuring Rupali Mukherjee and Angie Valdivia from 4 to 6 p.m. Eastern Time on the same day. So again, to register, please visit our conference website. We look forward to seeing you. Thank you.